Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or a very good day to you when and wherever you're listening from, and a very warm welcome to the show. I'm your host, Simon Laurie King, and this is The Slip Podcast. You have tuned in for a Slip Podcast. I'm here to seek the truth. Live from Scotland around the UK. The one and only Slick Podcast Enjoy the show Can I ask important questions? No matter how bizarre The truth might be Tune in for Slick Podcast Keeping it real, keeping it groovy Coming up on today's show My guest is British author John Hamer For years, John worked in the information and technology industry but after taking that brave step of faith, followed his true calling and became, as he is now, a successful author, geopolitical researcher and speaker. John's books are all very well researched and written and always received eagerly by his readers. To date, John has written The Falsification of History, Behind the Curtains, Volume 1 and 2, A Chilling Exposé of the Banking Industry, JFK, A Very British Coup, The Definitive Truth of the Assassination, Titanic's Last Secret, The Olympic. John also runs the website falsificationofhistory.co.uk, definitely worth a visit. Today we will be talking tragedy and of a massive cover-up that cost so many men, women and children their lives on that freezing night in the North Atlantic on April the 15th, 1912 at 0220, when the RMS Titanic finally disappeared beneath the waves and into the dark abyss taking so many with her. And like most cover-ups, the roots of this senseless waste of life lay in money. Saying the Titanic conjures up the story of tragedy, which has been immortalised in films, books and documentaries across the world. And to be honest, there can't be very many people in the Western world that haven't heard of her. My guest John Hamer spent three years of his life investigating and revealing the truth and is respected as the world authority on the subject into what factually led up to the sinking and more importantly, who and what was to blame. I have the heads up on this story and I can assure you my friends, it's definitely not the way we've been told. So without further delay, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome John Hamer to the show. Thank you Simon, good to be here. The RMS Titanic is one of the most famous ships of all time and the tragedy associated with her sinking and the loss of over 2,000 passengers and crew has been the subject of many documentaries, books and films. As we all are told, the Titanic set sail from Southampton at noon on Wednesday the 10th of April 1912 and even before the journey began, a merciful disaster in a way of a collision threatened to end this maiden voyage before it even began. Unfortunately, however, it was avoided and this doomed ship sailed out into the open sea and into the history books. According to the very extensive research that you have carried out over three years and subsequent books you have written on this subject, the story is in fact one of a series of accidents, incompetence and cover-ups on a truly criminal level. Uh, let's get the ball rolling. So please tell us a little about the background to the decision to build the Titanic and her sister ships and when and how the story began. Yeah, sure, Simon. Uh, before we actually get into that story, could I, I just like to give the listeners a little bit of background to my research to kind of put it all into perspective. As you rightly said, I did do three years solid research at this full time. It wasn't part time. Yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, it took me three years to, to, uh, to discover all this information. And the places that I found the information, uh, just to kind of give some credence to, to my research, was... I looked at the inquiry transcripts. There were two inquiries, the US and the British inquiry. So I, I spent a long time pouring through all those. I looked at Howland and Wolf public records as well. Howland and Wolf were the actual builders of the ship. Um, various archives. I spent a lot of time in libraries looking through contemporary newspaper reports. As many people will know, often the best way of finding the truth about any uh, political situation or any disaster or anything of that nature. The best way to find that out is always by looking at the contemporary uh, newspaper reports. Obviously, I use the Internet, which is obviously the ubi ubiquitous tool that, uh, you, know, it, you know, much information can be found from there. 
And I also looked at the Marconi wireless transcripts in the Bodleian Library at Oxford, which were very revealing too. So all those uh, elements plus many more went into my research. So that was just to give you a little bit of background to that. But the story be actually began in, in about 1908. Well, no, actually in 1908. Uh, a gentleman by the name of J.P. Morgan. Uh, his name still lives on to this day in the form of a huge financial <laughs> corporation that bears his name. He was head of that huge conglomerate corporation of that name uh, at that time. And he was also, what a lot of people are not aware of, he was also the ultimate owner of a, of a huge shipping conglomerate called IMM, International Mercantile Marine, of which the White Star shipping line to which Titanic belonged was a part. So it, it was kind of a subsidiary to the IMM group. And he decided... <clears throat> Excuse me. He decided uh, at this point in time to actually take a, a different view on uh, transant transatlantic uh, shipping market. Up until that point, the, the emphasis had always been on speed. Speed was the key. Speed was the, the market driver in any transatlantic crossings. Well, Morgan decided to look at it kind of out, outside the box. And he decided to turn his enterprise into one of, rather than speed, having the emphasis on luxury. So he decided to build three huge, luxurious liners. Uh, and these were to be the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic. And they would be built in that order. So three ships, almost, but not quite identical, were to be built. So he commissioned Harland and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast, which, by the way, built ships at that time exclusively for the White Star Line. And construction began in 1908. Now, there was a massive, massive investment of money required here, and it was financed by J.P. Morgan personally. And it was a huge gamble because he had this vision of this uh, using the, the, the luxury angle uh, in, in the transatlantic crossings market. And so he, but he, he put his knock on the line to be fair to the guy. But unfortunately, this plan depended on absolutely everything going right. That the finance situation was extremely precarious. And unfortunately, as we'll see as the story develops, the whole enterprise was actually beset by problems, ultimately ending in tragedy, of course. Well, as I understand it, the RMS Olympic, Titanic's elder twin sister, to repeat the question, uh, had several accidents. Um, I may be getting ahead of myself here, uh, be be beginning with one on her maiden voyage. I is that correct? Yeah. Olympic was the first one off the production line, as I said. And Olympic and Titanic were virtually identical. Not quite, but virtually. But Olympic was launched in March 1911. And obviously she began her operations before Titanic. Um, they were they were virtually identical, as I say. But yes, Olympic was kind of a, a jinxed ship right from the off. She had several serious accidents. Four, in fact, believe it or not, all before the launch of Titanic. So in other words, in the first few months of Olympic's life, there were several uh, impediments to Morgan's grant plan, if you like. I'll just talk a little bit briefly about those accidents, because as the story develops again, you will see how important these, these become. The first one was actually on her maiden voyage. As she entered New York Harbour, she actually collided with a tug and destroyed the tug. White, White Star Line was sued. Fortunately, there were no deaths or injuries, but the, damage, the tug was completely destroyed. Uh, but the damage to, to Olympic, sorry, was minimal because obviously the, the relative size of the ships, there was no comparison. Uh, that, so that was the first one. And then a few weeks later, on exiting New York Harbour, uh, she ran over a, a sunken wreck at Sandy Hook whilst exiting that particular body of water. And this caused severe damage to her propellers. Now, this is a particularly important point because she returned back across the Atlantic at around half speed, but nevertheless suffered significant further vibrational damage due to the imbalance caused by the propeller damage. So two propellers had to be replaced. And again, we will, we will come back to that shortly. 
Um, but the third incident, again, leaving New York Harbour, she hit a sandbank, ran aground, and what in nautical terms is called, she threw a propeller, which means she lost a propeller. The propeller blade was, the propeller itself was completely broken off. So that also had to be replaced, but they'd already used both spares. So they had to borrow one from the Titanic, which was obviously still under construction at this time. As I say, this is quite significant. We'll return to this later in the story. Uh, it actually, if you wouldn't mind, Sam, please make a note and remind me to return to that propeller issue when we get to talking about the aftermath, if I forget to do so. Yes, I'll do, I'll, do, um, I'll do this now. I'll do this now. Carry on, please, John. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and accident number four was the real big one. OK, this was a major, major incident. In September 1911, Olympic was involved in a massive high-speed collision with the British Navy cruiser HMS Hawk, which has subsequently become to be known in Titanic circles as the, the Hawk incident. After leaving Southampton Water and preparing to turn westwards, travelling clockwise around the Isle of Wight, she came into contact with, as I say, HMS Hawk, which was a Navy cruiser. Now, this Navy cruiser had a huge battering ram on the front of it. Now, this hit uh, Olympic square amidships uh, and caused massive, massive amounts of damage. Um, so much so that... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can we just define amidships, please, John? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just define... Well, just, it just means in roughly in the middle of the... Roughly in the middle of the ship, basically. <laughs> Is that you. okay? Yes, that's perfect. Thank okay. you. Carry on. All right. So she she actually limped back into Southampton. All the passengers had to be taken off, of course. They were ferried to the Isle of Wight, and, of course, of course their voyage was aborted. But she limped back to Southampton docks to be patched up, and even the patch-up operation took about two weeks. And then, of course, it was back to Belfast. Of course, the problem was... The, because these, these this was the biggest ship in the world, the biggest ship that the world had ever seen, there was only one dry dock in the world that could take her, and that was the Thompson Graving Dock at Harland and Wolfe in Belfast, where she'd been built. Uh, so she had to go back to, her, to Belfast for, for proper full-scale damage inspection and repairs. And once they got her back in the dry dock in Belfast, it was real, quickly realised that she was in far worse shape than was originally thought. Um, Lots and lots of damage, but worse worse than that even. Um, there was whenever there's a, a, an incident with a Royal Navy ship, there has to be a Royal Navy inquiry into any accident involving a ship. And of course, the Royal Navy inquiry, as one might expect, found Olympic's crew and therefore the White Star Line culpable for the accident. In actual fact, there's no doubt that it was H HMS Hawk that was at fault, but it was going far too fast under the conditions. And um, apparently, so the story goes, um, the, the, the steering mechanism jammed on HMS Hawk and she couldn't avoid the collision. But the point of this is that White Star was thus liable for many, many millions of pounds of expenses for repairs to both ships. Plus, of course, you've got to factor in the significant loss of revenues whilst Olympic was out of action at this point. And don't forget that JP Morgan was in a very, very precarious position financially. He needed this, this operation to be a financial success and very quickly. So things were now spiraling out of control for Morgan. OK, but amongst many, many other relatively minor issues, the major problem was that Olympic's keel was bent and distorted out of shape. And the repairs were estimated to cost more than to build a new ship from scratch. So I'm trying to paint a picture here of how, how precarious the situation was for the White Star <coughs> Line and JP Morgan himself. What actually happened at this point was that White Star now realized yes. that Olympic was damaged beyond economic repair in effect. And that significantly she was now uninsurable, of course. Um, so, therefore, an insurance write-off, and White Star Line had basically got no option but to declare her officially as a wreck, and that actually did happen. She was declared officially a wreck, which is an anomalous, anomalous to uh, a car insurance write-off. You know, uh, it's that kind of a situation. So, 
again, just to reiterate, because I think this is a really important point, due to the serious damage that she sustained, she was unable to ply a trade back and forth across the Atlantic any longer in order to begin to pay her way. So bankruptcy of White Star Line and Harland and Wolf was definitely on the cards at this point. And this is where the uh, little story takes a serious, significant turn, because I believe, and there is plenty of evidence to back this up, that at this point, Morgan and his co-conspirators then hatched a plan to kill two birds with one stone. And this was to solve the White Star financial problems and also remove opposition to the formation of the Federal Reserve Bank in one simple move. Now, we'll come on to the Federal Reserve Bank very shortly. I think you've got a question for me about that. But anyway, so to expedite this plan. Yeah. Yes, OK, good. This um, to expedite this plan, this involved patching up the wrecked Olympic as best they could and bracing the twisted keel with metal studs, struts. Uh, when Robert Ballard discovered the Titanic wreck site in 1985, well, actually he didn't, but that's another story uh, which we can perhaps go into if we have time. Uh, he was puzzled to find these struts, which, of course, didn't appear on the original construction blueprint. Okay, so this is another kind of little uh, pointer towards what actually went on. Okay. And... It's also possible to see the repairs to Olympic superstructure and steel plates in some pictures of Titanic prior to the maiden voyage. So there's plenty of, uh, shall we say, corroborating evidence to back up what I'm saying now. It's not just fanciful nonsense. You know, this is this is real and this is actually, I believe, what happened. OK, so this is really setting the scene for a remarkable and elaborate scam. And that was the switching of the identities of the two ships. The almost completed Titanic and the almost wrecked Olympic. Well, the actually wrecked Olympic. This is this is also corroborated by many Belfast ship workers' families who've had the story passed down to them through their families. And in actual fact, in 2013, I actually spent a week over in Belfast and I inter actually interviewed several of these families, and they all told me broadly the same tale, even though they didn't know each other. They were just descendants of the original ship, ship workers, Harlan and Wolf, and that was that their great-great-grandfathers or grandfathers in some cases had been told to keep quiet about what was going on, and they, if they ever breathed a word outside the dock gates of what had been going on within, then they and their families would never work again. And, of course, that kind of thing went on a lot in those days. And in those days, of course, there was no social security or dole. If anybody was thrown out of work, then, you know, it was almost a death sentence in effect. OK, so, yeah, fine, please do continue. So if, as you suggest, the identities of the two ships were switched, how was this carried out? I mean, there was no social media. So you've covered that the families were you know, told to be quiet because obviously they'd lost their, they might, may have had tied houses and, uh, but that, that's clear. Um, but how were they able to do something on such a monumental scale of deception? Yeah, yeah, indeed. It's, um, I mean, the other thing that to bear in mind uh, on a similar theme, of course, is that in those days there was no instant communications. There were no, there was no media. There were no roving news reporters looking for a story, that kind of thing. The only media that there were were newspapers, and it was quite. What is, I, I do believe that one or two people tried to blow the whistle, if you like, but of course, the complicit uh, mainstream news media would would easily block that kind of a, a situation. Um, I mean, that's another story, and I don't want to go into that too much. But um, okay, well, how they expedited it was after Olympics accident with HMS Hawk, she spent many, many weeks in the dry dock at Belfast. And the changes were actually made piecemeal over a, over a, the space of a few months. Uh, there were there were some slight differences in the ship. Um, I won't go into those at this point, unless you really want to know later. But at this stage, let me just suffice to say that the main differences in the two ships were slowly and, and in a piecemeal fashion eradicated and the two ships were made as ident identical as possible. Um, you know, for a layman looking at the two ships side by side, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You would have to know what the differences were before you could recognise them. So it wasn't that difficult a job in that sense. All of the uh, the nameplates, 
all of the linen, uh, possibly unique artwork to the Titanic. Um, everything would have had to have been switched. That is, again, that is a, a monumental task. Yeah, it's not as big as you might think, Simon, actually. Um, the only things that needed changing were, I mean, the main thing, obviously, was the nameplates. Um, the original names were engraved into the hull. And what happened was, instead of trying to fill it in and re-engrave it, they actually produced a, a steel nameplate and, and just simply placed it over the top of the original name. OK, but you mentioned the linen. The linen was White Star Standard. Everything was White Star Standard. The only thing that needed uh, the needed changing were um, the lifeboats. OK, well, it was a biggish job, uh, obviously, but uh, the menus were all, all headed with the ship's name and the letterheads. But other than that, there was nothing else. It was a, a, the final switch was made on one weekend and it was done by a, a small crew of insiders. And these men were paid £100 each, by the way, which was a heck of a lot of money in those days. It was almost a year's wages. Well, in fact, it was more than a year's wages. But at the same time, they were also <laughs> threatened with loss of livelihood again in the event of them spilling the beans in any way. Okay. I was just going to ask if you could uh, relate the sequence of events um, f from the beginning of that fateful maiden voyage. And obviously, uh, you know, take this wherever you need to. If I'm going too quickly, take it right okay. back. Well, yeah, let me, let me just backtrack slightly. Um, Titanic was launched in December 1911 and eventually renamed the Olympic. And work continued on the original Olympic from that point, which was now Titanic, to make her seaworthy enough for one dramatic final voyage. Okay. I mean, there are so many conflicting photographs of the two in various stages of both official and unofficial changes that even so-called experts struggle to separate the two now. Of course, most photos have no dates, and if surreptitious changes were being made alongside official ones, then the conclusion has to be that the photos prove nothing at all. So, going back to your original question, on Wednesday the 10th of April 1912, the new Olympic, uh, the Titanic rather, leaves Southampton on its maiden voyage for New York amidst huge, huge celebrations. It called at Cherbourg in France and Queenstown in Ireland with 2,200 passengers and crew on board. OK, but prior to that, again, let, let's just backtrack a little. Any ship that is launched and, and wants to begin public service has to have, in those days, had to have a Board of Trade Certificate of Seaworthiness. And to achieve that, they had to have a trial, quite a comprehensive trial, on, op on the open sea. OK, so a Board of Trade inspector would board the ship and it would be put through its paces and then at the end of that, if it passed the test, rather like an MOT for a car in, in effect, if it passed that test, then it was granted a BOT certificate of seaworthiness and it was free to become uh, a commercial enterprise, if you like. Now, interestingly, Olympic sea trial had taken a full day. They took her out into the Irish Sea and they spent a lot of time um, doing all sorts of tests on her. She, she had a thorough, rigorous test. This was the original Olympic I'm talking about when that was launched the previous year. But strangely enough, Titanic's alleged sea trial only took place on Belfast Lock, which is not open water at all. It's an enclosed uh, piece of water, and it lasted two hours. Now, that... I found that very strange indeed, and, and obviously it's not proof of anything, but I think it's highly significant circumstantially. And then, of course, it, it had to be taken down from Belfast to Southampton to begin its maiden voyage, and to do that, they have what is called the transit crew. Now, the transit crew responsible was responsible for the safe passage of the liner from Belfast to Southampton before the maiden voyage, and significantly... Not a single crew member of that transit crew signed on for the voyage. Now, bear in mind as well, this is another element to the story, that at that time, at that point, there had been a nationwide coal strike in the UK, six weeks. All the sea 
all the seamen and women were out of work. They were, you know, of course, as I said before, there was no dole, no social security, so they weren't getting paid. Their families were hungry. Now, significantly, this transit crew were decided not to sign on for the maiden voyage. Now, that is highly significant in my view. But to go back to the coal strike again, lots of liners were laid up and lying empty by the day of Titanic sailing. And the coal strike, as I say, had been ongoing for six weeks. And, there, and not only were seafarers desperate for work, but passengers trying to cross the Atlantic were desperate for berths on ships as well. OK, um, so another little element to the story that we'll, we'll move on to now. Uh, and this is, you know, it, it's a very complex story and it's quite difficult to actually um, tell it in a concise manner. But I, I'm, I'm doing my best here. So just bear with me. Five days prior to Titanic sailing, a ship called the Californian, the SS Californian, had departed for New York from London, again, as I say, in the midst of a nationwide coal strike and shortage. And this ship had no passengers, despite huge demand for transatlantic passengers, and no cargo either, except for, wait for it, 3,000 woolen sweaters, and 3,000 woolen blankets. Okay, even if, even Titanic actually sailed only half full, and not a lot of people know that. Um, she was only half full on her maiden voyage when there was a huge demand for places. In fact, first-class passengers hoping to transfer to Titanic when they discovered that it was about to sail were only offered second-class cabins, and I just wonder if this was an attempt to keep the numbers manageable for the planned rescue operation. Because I don't believe they intended to kill everyone on Titanic. I think, you know, the whole thing was, a, as these things t tend to happen, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Um, I think that they, they intended to save most people on there, but uh, but the whole thing went pear-shaped in effect. You, so you have a, um, a crew that have um, taken the alleged RMS Titanic out for seas trials um, only for two hours, and neither n n any of them, uh, none of them have uh, wanted to sign on with that ship. So it it basically stinks. They know something, and also um, the the California set sail with what amounted exactly. to rescue equipment um, for survivors. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly, Simon. Yeah, that's it. Um, so, um, yeah, sure. So. Uh, as I say, California had set sail from London five days before the Titanic. And on the evening of the 14th of April, which was the Sunday and the day of the disaster later that evening, Californian stopped dead in the middle of the ice field where Titanic was due to pass shortly and just left the drift with the ice while keeping all boilers fully fired at the same time. In fact, three experienced transatlantic sea captains gave evidence at the American inquiry that it was not common practice to stop or even slow down in ice fields, except sometimes in extremely foggy, foggy conditions, as icebergs are extremely visible and thus avoidable, even at normal cruising speeds, because this has been used as the excuse uh, by the mainstream as to why Californian was stopped in the ice field, and that was because oh, it, the, the ice was too thick, um, so that's why it stopped. But that evidence from those three sea captains, and it's there in black and white in the inquiry transcripts for anyone who wants to look at that, uh, gave evidence to to actually destroy that particular point. So, <clears throat> on Sunday, the April the fourteenth of April at eleven forty p.m. local time, Titanic allegedly hits the iceberg and sinks three hours later with the loss of 1,500 lives. Now, I actually question whether or not there was an iceberg at all. Um, and I'll come on to explain a little bit more about that in a moment. But there are many, many stories about uh, ice on the deck, um, people making jokes about, um, you know, going outside to fetch a piece of ice to put in their whiskey and sodas and what have you. You know, there are st apocryphal stories about Third class passengers play football with huge chunks of ice on the decks and generally having a, a fantastic time messing around with the ice. Now that's that's all perfectly plausible, and and my uh, my um, contention does not uh, fly in the face of that 
because it's a fact that at that, the point of the disaster, the, t the engines were thrust abruptly into reverse. Now, this was a very, very cold night. It was below freezing. It was uh, minus two centigrade, the air temperature outside. And there was a copious buildup of ice on all the external uh, deck, deck buildings and, for example, the, um, the wireless mast, which was a huge construction and went almost the length of the ship. Um, there was a, a massive buildup of ice. So thrusting the event engines uh, in, into reverse uh, would, could have easily shaken loose a lot of ice from the, from the rigging and the wiring. Uh, so that that's you know that still fits the the, the story, okay. Um, and also the other element to the uh, to the de disaster is the the strange damage to Titanic. The steel plates that were pierced had a strange shape to them. the The puncture was fifteen centimeters wide, which is about six inches. Is it? Yep, six inches wide. But it penetrated 1.6 meters, which is about five feet, into the inner skin of the ship. Well, I mean, that would have been a really bizarrely shaped ice outcrop on an iceberg to achieve that. And of course, it was 300 feet long as well, the gash, which, again, that, I mean, to be fair, that could be explained by the motion of the ship. But the actual width and depth into the ship could not, I believe. That is a really, really strange shape. Uh, any kind of ice crop, ice outcrop would on an iceberg would surely have snapped off in contact with steel. I mean, steel uh, ice, ice is known to be very, very strong. In fact, under certain conditions, even stronger than steel, but not uh, a piece of ice that shape. Uh, it would have it would have undoubtedly snapped off. So um, you know that that's that's kind of uh, where we're at with that particular question. So so would that have been uh, from the HMS Hawk, or would it have been from something else? I couldn't imagine a, another ship colliding with the Titanic and then merrily uh, sailing off on its way, because surely it would have had an account from the lookouts. But um, it, it was that previous damage that you would have been talking about that you're saying that it wasn't ice. No, actually, you you you've kind of touched on it there. Uh, I mean, th there are several possibilities and, and i don't claim to um t t you know to be the uh final arbiter on that because you know i don't think we'll ever know the real truth but you say that there was no ship but there is plenty of evidence to say that there was another ship it certainly wasn't the damage that had done been done by the hawk uh, really? no i mean this was a completely different shape to the damage done by the hawk um but uh, again i was i was going to come on to this later but i might as well cover it now um, there are several eyewitness reports that, uh, again, they, they're kind of hidden from public view, but they are there if you care to look at it. They were, they're certainly in contemporary newspapers, and it was also mentioned in the American Inquiry that one or two people who were actually on deck at the time, incredibly, and this is incredible, saw what has become as the yellow funnel, known as the yellow funnel steamer incident actually alongside titanic at the very moment when it allegedly hit the iceberg was a much smaller black ship with a yellow funnel now several people reported seeing this and i take on board exactly what you say simon about why would they do that and why you know that everybody would have been rescued but not only that apparently and again this has all come out piecemeal the british navy was tracking the ship all the way across the Atlantic. There were several other ships in the vicinity. There is, again, in the American Inquiry, there is a, an affidavit that was read out by a Canadian passenger on another ship whose name escapes me for the moment. Uh, my, brain, my brain isn't what it was. And they, he said that the ship that he was on, and this was a doctor, a very you know, eminent, well-respected guy who had no reason to lie, he said that the ship he was on, he was stood on the deck and they sailed right past the sinking Titanic within about um, literally less than a quarter of a mile. He said, and it was, they were so near, you could actually look down on the lifeboats. He said, and the ship never stopped. It just went on 
sailing past. And again, all this information is in my book. And by the way, um, my book contains far, far, far more information than I'm ever going to be able to impart in a in, in a, um, a session such as this, Simon. So, you know, it, it's very important to know that, that what I'm giving is, is just a very, very broad outline. I can appreciate that. Um, can I ask you about some of the uh, uh, obviously carry on the, on the trail of thought you are, but can I ask you about some of the passengers on board, um, especially, yeah. am I right in saying the managing director of the White Star Line uh, was also on board and he survived and was uh, ridiculed after the fact? Yeah, you're referring to Bruce Ismay, who was the, the managing director of the White Star Line. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he, he actually, I mean, the story yeah. goes... There's no way of knowing whether it's true or not, but the story goes that he actually sneaked into a lifeboat, and he was and he was vilified forevermore because obviously the the lifeboat drill was women and children first. But he actually sneaked into a lifeboat, and I think this is depicted in some of the Titanic films as well, um, especially the famous one, the James Cameron one that was made in 1999. There is an actually a little scene where. Ismay actually just sneaks unnoticed into a lifeboat and then the order's given to lower the lifeboat and he escapes that way. Uh, but yeah, he was absolutely vilified. I mean, he had a nervous breakdown as a result of it, all the pressure that came and, and the opprobrium that was thrust upon him over that incident. And um, he, he, he resigned very, very shortly afterwards and basically died a broken man. But, um, you know, that's a, that's a completely other story. I'll relate what you've asked me to remind you about because uh, I really do need to. I, I think I've, I've, I've rushed you and interrupted you. Um, but I'll, we'll just go back to the propeller incident and then just take that where you need to take it, John. Um, OK, I'm not quite ready for that one yet, Simon. Sorry. <laughs> I've, I've still got um, a little bit to cover before. Well, that's fine. No, carry on. Uh, okay. Please carry on. That's so fine. if you... Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've kind of covered that little section now. If you want to ask me the, your next question, I'm, I'm ready for it. In your book, you talk about, I mean, I, I suppose it's moving forward, but in your book, you talk about an intrinsic connection between the sinking of the Titanic yeah. and the forming of the Federal Reserve Bank in the US um, in the year 1913. Um, could you elaborate? Yeah, on of that? course. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the Titanic, sto the, the actual story of the disaster isn't quite finished yet. But I think, I think at this point, we do need to, quite rightly, um, as you say, elaborate on that a little bit because it, it's kind of more grist to the mill in, in terms of the overall uh, rationale behind the story, I guess. Yeah, um, it's it's interest. It's an interesting point, this because. Um, well, to start at the beginning, we need to backtrack to 1910 now. In 1910, seven prominent financiers representing various different financial interests in America met incognito uh, on a, an island called Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia in the USA, not Georgia, Russia, to hatch a plan to usurp the power to create money from the American government. OK, the result of this was to be the Federal Reserve Bank, which is the equivalent to the Bank of England in the UK. It's a central bank. Up until that point in time, for those people who are listening who, who don't understand the central banking system, um, the issuance and supply of money had been done solely by the American government. But what this plan was to do, it was, as I said, it was to usurp that power to create money by a group of private financiers. And. Again, as an aside, all central banks are private banks. They are not, as we are led to believe deceptively, governmental controlled. Even the Bank of England is a privately owned institution with shareholders, which, by the way, are kept secret. So the Federal Reserve Bank in America um, was being proposed at this point, but it wasn't without strong opposition from certain mega rich individuals. There were four extremely wealthy men at that time who were totally opposed to the Federal Reserve Plan. Um, and this were, these were, to name them, uh, John Jacob Astor of the famous Astor family, uh, Benjamin Guggenheim, uh, a gentleman by the name of Isidore Strauss, and another one by the name of Charles Lindbergh. Now, this wasn't the famous flyer. It was the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic. This was his father, Charles Lindbergh Sr., who was an American congressman. 
And the reason that they opposed the Federal Reserve Plan was because they could see exactly what was going to happen as a result of it. Uh, it wasn't because of any altruism on their part. Um, it was it was more to do that the, with the fact that they knew that the Federal Reserve Plan would mean soaring inflation because that's what central banks do. They issue money, uh, it causes inflation, and it, it reduces the value of goods uh, but simply by the uh, you know, by by that the fact that of the inflation and inbuilt debt within each uh, note that is issued, and this of course this inflation would severely Im- impact their own fortunes. So they 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 had created a strong resistance movement on the um, American East Coast, which was beginning to win the battle against the Federal Reserve conspirators. Now, three of these men died on the Titanic. Uh, and I don't believe in coincidences. I say this to a lot of people, but I just do not believe in coincidences. And I, again, I believe this is very significant. And in fact, um, a, a kind of a backup to that, if you like, is the fact that Titanic's maiden voyage was really, really hyped up. I mean, she, don't forget, she was the second one off the production line, not the first. Looking at contemporary newspaper reports, there was barely a mention of Olympics maiden voyage. Just a couple of column inches in in one particular paper is all I managed to find. But by contrast, Titanic's maiden voyage was splashed all over the front pages of many, many newspapers. Now, I think that this was a ploy by Morgan to kind of attract the rich and famous, including those three gentlemen who died who were trapped in Europe because of the coal strike at that time. So I believe that that is intrinsically connected. Now, not only were the rich and famous lured in great numbers to this hyped-up maiden voyage, but many of them, especially friends of Morgan, mysteriously failed to show at Southampton Docks in time for the departure of the ship, along with Morgan himself. Morgan sent a telegram two hours before the ship was due to sail saying that he was too ill to travel, but he was later photographed that day with his mistress in a French holiday resort. And as I said, 50 of his friends and colleagues also failed to turn up. Um, (laughs) I mean, so is this perhaps how he lured Astor, Guggenheim and Strauss on board by personal invite and by booking a passage for himself? I mean, we'll never know the real truth behind it all, but it's possibly comparable to the famous biblical story about King Herod luring his rivals to parties, then leaving the party, barring the doors and setting the place ablaze. Um, Kind of anomalous to that. Um, (laughs) So it's all very interesting. There were um, a lot of rich and famous, as you say, that died on the on the Titanic. Um, I mean, the, the owner of Macy's, Yes. I believe uh, the most uh, was it uh, John Astor or Astor, uh, the richest man in America at the time. There was lots of people. It, it does. It does. No, that was Isidore Strauss. Uh, what was What was the end game? So the, these uh, the uh, the fellow um, board directors of the Federal Bank, uh, they're out the way. So what was the plan after? Right. That? Okay. Well, obviously it was to uh, it was to form the bank and and usurp the creation of money from the American government, which is exactly what happened. There was no opposition. I mean, that they died in April 1912, and by by the following year, 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank was formed, um, and that was the beginning of the American national debt. Um, at that time, uh, the American America was totally debt free because they didn't have a central bank. And um, the the actual creation of that bank was what created the, the national debt. And who is the national debt owed to? It's owed to the directors of the Federal Reserve Bank, QED. So we're going back to the night of the sinking of the Titanic. And there are lots of stories of her- heroism and lots of stories of cowardice. Do you have a handle on roughly how many people had died that night because i believe that all of the lifeboats weren't actually full to capacity they didn't have enough as i'm led to believe it was 20 lifeboats um but out of those 20 lifeboats they were not all filled to capacity correct now that's that's a very interesting question actually because um 
the reason that I believe that they weren't all filled to capacity was, and here we come back to the Californian again now. We'll pick up the story about the Californian, if I may, because what happened was Californian was sat there in the ice field waiting, waiting for Titanic to appear. Now, unfortunately, there was kind of, there must have been a miscommunication because Californian never got in contact with Titanic and Titanic was unable to contact Californian. Now, by the time Titanic arrived in the ice field, it was kind of 11.30 p.m. in the evening. And unfortunately, the Californian's wireless operator must not have been told what to expect because it shut down the wireless and gone to bed. So the ship was in complete radio silence. So Titanic couldn't contact them. And they obviously couldn't contact Titanic because the wireless was shut down. So, um, oh gosh, I've lost the thread of what I was talking about now. So, yeah, um, uh, just, just repeat the question you asked me before. Sorry, Simon, to uh, to stumble here. Sorry, it was it was to do with the capacity that was of it. the lifeboats yes. uh, carried upon the RMS Titanic and uh, them not being uh, full to capacity. So. Okay, I believe that the plot was for, uh, of which only certain senior senior personnel were involved, uh, both on the Californian and on the Titanic. Um, I believe that the Titanic, um, the, the Titanic captain and and his senior senior officers, um, were expecting the the Californian. In fact, several passengers said afterwards that they'd been told by White Star Line staff. That the Californian was on its way to pick them up, which is very interesting because the two ships hadn't been in communication at this point. In fact, they never were in in in, com- in communication at any point ever. Um, so that was quite interesting. But I believe, as I said, it was the intention to save most of the passengers, and I'll, but just allow a select few to become victims to cover up the disposal of the Federal Reserve conspirators. But I believe what 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 happened was happening was now. Captain Smith of the Titanic had spotted a ship not too far away, which he believed was the Californian. Okay, but in actual fact, it wasn't because the Californian was in the wrong place. It wasn't where it was expected to be, and neither was Titanic. So there was a miscarriage of communications. And of course, in those days, communication wasn't easy like it is now. So it's quite understandable that kind of a mix up could occur. But what the ship that Smith had seen that he believed was Californian, and this is why he sent was was actually a, a seal a seal hunting ship called the Samson. I'll come back to the, that in a minute. Um, but I believe that Smith was trying to get as many passengers off the la- on the lifeboats as possible, and he kept the numbers down to make it easier to row from the Titanic to the Californian, which he believed was only about three or four miles away because he could see the lights of this ship, but try as he might, he couldn't get in communication with it, so he couldn't confirm it was the Californian, so he just assumed it was. And that's what the lifeboats were doing. They just took a, a few passengers to make them lighter, so he could make the, the return trip and back several times more quickly than <coughs> trying to do it full. Uh, and I believe that that's that what was going on. Okay. So I, I also, just to sort of continue with the story a little bit, I also believe that Stanley Lord, who was captain of the Californian, as I say, he was in on the plot. But I think that, um, oh, and, and by the way, the Californian was part of the Red Star Line, which was also owned by J.P. Morgan. Um, <laughs> coincidence? Well, maybe. Um, and but, but the reason that Lord had been chosen for this particular job, I believe, was that several years previously, He'd undertaken an exercise, a military exercise, where he'd successfully evacuated 2,000 people from a ship in under an hour. So it was obviously perfect, the perfect man for, for the job. Um, so, yeah, I think, as I said, the idea was that California would be standing by, complete with 3,000 blankets and sweaters to pick up most of the survivors. Yeah, and also the fact that um, Californian had been told to expect white rockets from Titanic, but she actually sent up coloured rockets. Now, let's go back to the Samson, the seal hunting ship. The captain of the Samson came forward 
about a year later and confessed that that was his ship that was there. He never admitted to it at that point because what they were doing was illegal and he didn't want to be uh, held accountable. Now, the Samson had sent out its little rowing boats onto the, all the different ice flows so that all the uh, the personnel there could uh, capture the seals, you know, do all that good stuff with clubbing the seals to death so they could, um, uh, you know, uh, gather their, their fur, which was very valuable, of course. And um, to, in order to call back the rowing boats, the Samson was actually sending up white rockets. So, um, but Titanic actually only ever sent up coloured rockets. So she sent up red, white and blue rockets. So there was lots and lots of confusion going on here. Um, some of it deliberate, some of it in unintentional. And as we know, the the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. And I think this is exactly what was happening here. The confusion was was massive. Okay. So, yeah. So was Captain Smith uh, in on this? I'm, I'm guessing he was. Uh, in your opinion, was it? did he have the wherewithal to know? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, I mean, I think he had to be. Yeah, I mean, he would have been in on it, as was several senior members of the crew. But I think other than that, uh, probably... Um, you know, probably everyone else was kept in the dark. Uh, you know, obviously, with these situations, the fewer people that know about it, the easier it is to cover it up. And I think that's, that was probably the, uh, the methodology at work there, Simon. Would um, would um, uh, Bruce Ismay, would he have done? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, but, of, of course, he believed that, you know, the, the, the Californian was going to rescue everyone. They didn't expect... Um, you know, the, the, a disaster on that scale at all. They thought that um, they could sink the ship, claim the insurance and get away with it uh, because, you know, obviously the ship was worthless at this point. So it was a, it was basically an elaborate insurance scam, as well as, as I say, killing two birds with one stone and getting rid, rid of the Federal Reserve conspirators because J.P. Morgan was intrinsically involved in the Federal Reserve formation and, and he actually became one of the... Um, one of the um, the owners of the Federal Reserve after the event. So it was very much in his interest to, um, you know, to, to facilitate this total scam. So the fourth ship, to my understanding, in this story, which uh, we're only just touching on at the moment, and uh, please feel free to go any direction you want. The fourth ship, to my understanding, was the Carpathia. Correct. Could you talk a little bit about the Carpathia? Yeah, sure. I mean, the Carpathia was very interesting, actually. The Carpathia... For those who don't know, the Carpathia was the ship that eventually picked up all Titanic survivors from the lifeboats. Um, and a, a little side, actually, at this point, a lifeboat was actually seen, and again, it's another anomaly to the official story, which is perhaps inexplicable, but I, I'll tell a little story anyway. As well as all Titanic's lifeboats, there was another lifeboat there as well that was a, of a different colour and design to those of Titanic. Now, this is kind of more evidence for there being another ship, i.e. the yellow-funneled uh, black ship that I mentioned previously. That, that's another possibility that that lifeboat had been dislodged from that ship in the event of whatever it was doing next to the Titanic, holding her or whatever, whether it was kind of an icebreaker or equipped with some kind of a, a tin opener contraption on the side of it. I have no idea, but um, it's, it's an interesting an anomaly. But yes, to get back to the Carpathia, Again, the Carpathia um, is interesting because it was allegedly the nearest ship to, to the Titanic, but we know that that is absolutely not the case whatsoever. We know that there was the Yellow Funnel ship there. We know that there was the other ship that the Canadian doctor had been on. We know that there were British uh, warships tracking Titanic very closely. So, But allegedly, Carpathia was the nearest ship. And she picked up all the survivors around three three hours after the ship founded, uh, 705 in total. But Carpathia was, uh, and I, I, I honestly can't explain this at all. I have no th plausible theory about this at all. But Carpathia had recently been fitted out almost like a hospital ship, although it had passengers and it was on its way from America to, uh, uh, to Europe. It, it, it was fitting out like a hospital ship and it, it had got seven doctors upon, on board, which is pretty weird. 
Um, so yeah, um, it was. It, it, it's a very strange anomaly, the Carpathia, but it, it it was that ship that picked up all the survivors, um, and, uh, and 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 took them back to New York. So uh, after after the disaster, again, try not to get too far ahead because obviously it's um, definitely relevant. Uh, how was this explained? How how was J.P. Morgan, if he was ever in the dock, uh, and Ismay, uh, I, I understand that Smith allegedly, air quotes, didn't survive. How did these people answer for the tragedy um, right. which we're all we've all been sold in the history books how did they get away well with there that? was as i said there was two, there were two inquiries um uh, you know of which um, obviously morgan wasn't uh, wasn't summoned to appear i mean he, he was way way above that in the hierarchy i mean he wasn't it was allegedly not involved so he didn't have any questions to answer at all you know in fact uh, you know the, the sympathy was for him not the uh, opprobrium directed at him. Uh, but even at, even at the time, both inquiries, the American and the British, were widely thought to be whitewashers. Um, there were no witnesses. For example, there were no witnesses called from the passenger contingent at all, except at the British inquiry, the, the Gordon family of the famous gin company. But no witnesses were allowed to give any personal evidence and were strictly forbidden from speaking other than to give sim simple answers to direct questions without any elaboration at all. Um, and in fact, when uh, Captain Lord of the California was, was questioned by the press what, when, uh, when they eventually got back to uh, dry land, uh, Lord said, and I quote, I am not allowed to give out state secrets. You will have to ask those in the office, which again, I feel is a fairly, fairly significant quote. As I say, don't get me wrong on this. I, I don't claim to have the definitive answer. All I do have is an alternative to the official story, but which doesn't necessarily cover every single possible uh, outcome. I, d I don't claim to have this absolutely sewn up and 100% and put to bed as to what exactly did happen. All I can do and all anyone can ever do is is kind of contradict the official story with known facts. And that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm not providing an alternative solution other than what is my own possible speculation, which may or may not be wildly inaccurate. Um, but it's just a case of really putting forward a different version of events that, that um, the, the facts that I've discovered uh, have painted. What would you think would be the most damning piece of evidence, uh, apart from which is becoming more apparent, the switch uh, with uh, Olympic? Uh clearly uh, points out that um, this is not as we've been told. There are so many. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are so many different um, minor uh, bits of evidence. You know, that, I mean, I think I probably told you most of the uh, the major ones, but there are so many other minor ones that are that I cover in my, in my book totally. Um, but, for example, there's there's. Um, oh, yeah, the propeller. The, the propeller situation, which um, I mentioned, where uh, Olympic had two propellers replaced and then it had to pinch one from Titanic before she was built. When uh, when you look at pictures of the wreck of Titanic, the propeller, the starboard propeller, which was replaced by Titanic's propeller, um, has, um, has the, the number 401 stamped on it. Now, 401 was Titanic's build number. And... So, <laughs> the you know the the olympic had titanic's uh starboard propeller put onto it and, and, what you, and there are actually photographs of the propeller down at the, on the bottom of the seabed with the number 401 on it which again it's kind of circumstantial evidence but it it's another element to it uh you know that it I, I can't actually put my hand on my heart and say this particular thing or that particular thing is 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 the most compelling because there are, there's just so much. I mean, there's a mountain of this stuff, um, you know. And I think I've given a lot already, but there there are several more bits still to come if we can uh, if we can continue. We'll just um, we'll be right back uh, after this break. Hi, this is Jazz. If you can sing along with our jingle at the Slick Podcast you could win an exclusive SLK hoodie or Zuddy. 
The Jingle is on our Facebook page and on YouTube. Download, sing along and put a link to your performance on the Slick Podcast Facebook page. All entries, of course, must be real and groovy. And a winner will be chosen in July by Mike and Jared from the Conflict Radio Podcast. Good luck. And we're back. My guest joining me today is author John Hamer. John, please continue. Okay. Well, I'll just, I'll just kind of relate some more um, kind of facts and figures about what, what went on. A- after the disaster and when the surviving crew members arrived back in England two weeks after the disaster, they were all illegally detained overnight in a holding pen in Plymouth Docks in a damp shed without access to legal or union representation, and they were coerced into signing a document that they all believed was the Official Secrets Act. And they were kept against their will, as I said, overnight. Um, you know, you know. again, why would they do this? If this was a, a genuine kind of incident, a genuine accident, all that would have been totally unnecessary. And and to go back to the iceberg situation, did she really hit an iceberg? I mean, there were only actually five known eyewitnesses to 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 the iceberg. Um, one of them was uh, Murdoch, the first officer. There were two, the two lookouts in the crow's nest, the helmsman, and one other ordinary seaman. Now, significantly, Murdoch allegedly committed suicide in the aftermath of the collision, leaving the only witnesses four working class men. Now, how easy would it have been to keep them quiet through threats to their and their families' future livelihoods, as as we mentioned before in, you know, the earlier bit of the talk? Um, So, yeah, in fact, there were six significant deaths. Captain Smith, allegedly, Chief Officer Wild, First Officer Murdoch. They were the three most senior officers, all of whom I suspect to have been privy to the plan. Okay, Guggenheim, Strauss, Guggenheim, Strauss and Astor, as I've already said. Uh, there's no real eyewitness evidence of what happened to them at all. According to the official leg- legend, none of them attempted to escape for some bizarre reason. Uh, Captain Smith allegedly decided to go down with his ship. Murdoch allegedly shot himself. Why? Guggenheim allegedly, and this is again is, is an, another apocryphal tale, his quote was, we're dressed up in our best and prepared to go down like gentlemen. I mean, why would anybody just give up their lives in that way? That's a really strange thing, but nobody seems to question it. And Astor apparently just walked away from a lifeboat, never to be seen again, after being denied access with his wife. And we're told that Strauss and his wife retired to their stateroom to await death together peacefully. All very highly romantic and melodramatic stuff, not to mention very convenient. Um, but it's but it's highly significant to me that Guggenheim, Astor and Strauss were all well known to be opponents of the Federal Reserve System. And significantly, they were also the most well known of the victims. Very few, significantly, of whom were first class passengers. So basically, Morgan got his, his insurance payout afterwards. And the, and the Federal Reserve came to pass the following year with little to no resistance. Going back to uh, Captain Smith uh, briefly, what I've read, he wasn't exactly um, yeah. without blemish on his record as far as accidents Correct. go. I mean, I think this is highly significant as well, Simon. I'm, I'm glad you raised that point because um, I wondered actually if Smith had been coerced into doing this because, again, not, not a lot of people know this, but this was going to be Smith's final voyage anyway. He was due to retire. Now, had he been, was he coerced into going along with this plan because of his appalling track record of safety? He'd been involved in so many accidents. I mean, he was captain of the Olympic when all these accidents occurred before Titanic was launched. The four accidents that we talked about right at the very beginning. He was captain of the Olympic. And, and he, his whole career up to that point had been a catalogue of disasters and incidents and accidents. Uh, you know, several crew members were lost in one particular one, which were put down to his fault. Now, significantly, um, insurance companies often would not insure ships where captains had been involved in accidents that was deemed to be their fault. Now, this is what didn't just happen once in Smith's case. It happened several times. 
So again, it's all very highly suspicious. Um, you know, inexplicable. I can't offer an explanation. But it, again, it's just more circumstantial evidence as to what maybe did happen. And do you think that maybe some of the people, uh, such as Smith, um, were maybe um, whisked away uh, to live maybe retirement in America, uh, assume different identities? Maybe a bit fanciful, but uh, it just seems to me that people walking back to their staterooms and that sort of thing, although yeah, some of those could have died. Um, I don't know. It, it smacks of something not quite right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, actually, in my book, I cover the uh, the cap the 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 tale about Captain Smith, whereby uh, it was reported in a uh, in a newspaper in in America uh, a few years after the Titanic disaster that he'd actually been seen in Baltimore, in the city of Baltimore, by someone who'd been one of his shipmates. Uh, a man by the name of Peter Pryle, who was a, a wealth, as described uh, in the newspaper as report, as a wealthy retired ship owner. And Peter Pryle apparently bumped into Captain Smith at Baltimore Railway Station and, uh, and, and greeted him by name, and Smith greeted him by name, and uh, they had a conversation. Um, but Smith kind of hurriedly brushed him aside and, and went about his business. And then Pryor saw him again a few days later walking around Baltimore, but this time he didn't speak to him. Um, so again, I've covered all that in the book, and that's an interesting story. And 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 this and this this guy turned up who was referred to uh, as uh, Silent Smith. He was called, and he was a guy who resembled Smith, who had actually gone um, kind of senile or suffering from from dementia. Dementia. And he was uh, he he was appeared in a newspaper report as well, and some of the facts about him actually fitted Captain Smith as though, as you say, he had actually been smuggled on board the Carpathia and then set up with a new life in America. It's perfectly possible. It's I know it sounds really fantastic, but you know, stranger things have happened, as I'm sure most people realise. Well, one of those uh, I could relate to again, allegedly. Um, was the um, space shuttle disaster where, uh, unfortunately, uh, the astronauts lost their lives, but all of their twins still survive. And some people say, well, they weren't twins. That is actually them. That's the analogy I would the draw. I mean, people can look that up if they want. Um, the yeah. space shuttle disaster. I think, I don't know if it was the Atlantic, but apparently uh, at the astronauts' funeral um, funerals, uh, none of the their twins turned up. I just, I'm just throwing that out there. It just seems, like, and I'll also say as well, this whole thing smacks of yeah. No, this is not. This is not an allegation. It's just a comparison. This whole thing smacks of uh, a late Edwardian 9/11. Read into that as you will. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, you, 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 you're spot on there, Simon. I mean, you right to mention the Challenger space shuttle disaster as well. That's a, and, and this thing is is. You know, some people may find this hard to believe, but this kind of thing goes on all the time. I mean, it's fairly common. And I mean, I, I've been a, a geopolitical researcher for 20 plus years, and I've written about lots and lots and lots of these different incidents. The world as we know it is is totally different to the actuality. Uh, we're, we're sold a very different version of reality to what is actually taking place. Call me a conspiracy theorist. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time. But, um, you know, this, this kind of thing absolutely goes on all the time. Um, it's so difficult to actually find the truth about anything. I think that conspiracy theorists is not really how I would describe you. Are you certainly not in this interview with uh, your, your research and the facts you put forward. But obviously you're inviting people to oh, check that. Um, I, I wouldn't call you a conspiracy theorist. And uh, thanks for correcting me. It wasn't the Atlantic. It was the Challenger. Thank you. Uh, but that would, that would be the analogy. It just seems uh, the, the whole uh, not caring about human life. Uh, it, it's, it's complete tragedy, to be honest with you. A complete and utter tragedy that uh, the Titanic disaster uh, could have been averted. And I suppose it would have been fair to say they were trying to avert it, but it wasn't. And there were so many lives lost. Um, and that there, therein lays the tragedy. So, what were your findings? Uh, what was your conclusion? Yeah, I mean, in, in a nutshell, I, I believe that it was a 
it was a kill two birds with one stone operation, get rid of the Federal Reserve conspirators, and also uh, bail White Starline and JP Morgan out the financial hole that they found themselves in. I mean, I've got you know one or two other bits and pieces of, of info as well. I can I can relate if if there's time to do that, Simon. Please do. Yes, plenty of time. Please okay. Do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if if we look at the insurance scam itself, I mean, Titanic cost two point five million pounds to build in 1912 money which equates to well over 200 million these days um so you know it was obviously a, a lot of money um you know the badly damaged olympic was uninsurable white star line normally insured ships for 75 percent of their value that was just their company policy um but and pay, so payout for titanic should have been about 1.8 million but in fact, and again, this is this is really significant. The insurance on the Titanic, the week before the maiden voyage, was up to three point two million, and this was paid out within a week of the disaster. Now, you, anyone listen to this? You know, spill some red wine on their white carpet. You know, you get grilled for six weeks about it before they pay out. Yet they they paid out three point two million pounds, which is over a quarter of a billion pounds in today's money. Within a week. Now, you know, what does this kind of thing tell us? It tells us me specifically that um, there are there are all sorts of machinations and chicanery going on somewhere in the background involving Mr. J.P. Morgan. It all boils down to, you know, you I mean, mentioned 9-11. This is shades of um, 9-11 with Larry Silverstein insuring the, the Twin Towers for far, far more than they were worth, you know, a, a few weeks before the uh, before they came down. Uh, you know, Larry Silverstein was the owner of the, the Twin Towers and, and he insured them for some, I can't remember what the figures were, but it was billions and billions and billions of dollars, far more than they were ever worth, just a, a matter of weeks before they were brought down. Uh, so it, it's kind of uh, synonymous with that in, in a way. Completely. Uh, the, the, the strangeness of the whole situation with the Titanic, and the, I actually said initially four ships, but uh, if it was the, the guys that are illegally looking for seals, the British Navy track in the Carpathia, uh, the, uh, the Titanic and the Californian, uh, well, that's six or seven ships. Is that correct? Yeah, could be even more, actually. Um, you've got your Car Titanic, Carpathia, Californian, the Samson, the Canadian ship whose name escapes me, where the guy uh, you know, claimed that he, he was looking down on the Titanic lifeboats. Then at least three British Navy ships, so that's about eight, I think. Yeah, um, but who knows? I mean, there could even have been more than that. It's just the whole thing is it's a mystery. <laughs> it's a real mystery. Yeah, to say nothing of the 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 ship or whatever it was that hit the Titanic allegedly, because that was uh, that is intriguing in its in itself. Yes, of course. I, I just can't quite uh, get my yeah. head around that. that. That's very very strange. Very strange. That's just ensuring yeah. the job is done and done where they think they should do it with everything set in place. But, yeah. you know, it didn't work. I mean, I think another element to it all, Simon, is the uh, the, the, the British government. It was definitely covered up by the British government as well and probably the American government too. I, I believe that it was impossible that this could have happened without the collusion of the British government. Um I think that the situation was that the Liberal government of the day, uh, the Prime Minister at the time was H.H. H. Asquith, he knew that if White Star and Holland and Wolf tanked, which they would have done, uh, but for this incident, there would have been massive political repercussions. Uh, I estimate that there would have been at least twenty five to 30,000 people out of work, plus many dependent industries. And the Liberals were at a very tenuous majority at that time, and I don't think they would have got re-elected. Um, you know, so I think that was a big incentive for the British government to to actually expedite a cover-up. But I think equally and probably, possibly more importantly, they had an agreement with Morgan. Again, let me backtrack to 1908 just for a second. It was illegal at that time for uh, any foreign businessman to own a British shipping line. OK, so that, that's an interesting point in itself as well. So there must have been some kind of bribery or brown envelope situation going on there. Otherwise, Morgan wouldn't have been able to buy the White Star Line. But um, 
I believe that Morgan agreed with the British government upon, uh, as a condition of his taking over White Star Line, that any White Star Line ship could be requisitioned as troop carriers in the event of war being declared. Now, the British government knew that there was a kind of a, an arms build-up in Europe at this point, because it was just before the First World War, obviously. And I think that they wanted to use the White Star Line ships as troop carriers in the event of the war. Um, so they also knew that if they had bankrupted, if if, if White Star and Alan and Wolf had been bankrupted, uh, that Morgan was the main creditor of the White Star Line anyway, under a different uh, guise, and he would have been able to requisition his ships, and so they would lose their troop ships. Um, so, I, again, that's another important point. Um, it was also a very common scam in those days. So, I was going to say, uh, on paper then, uh, the British Navy uh, were not liable for the incident, which now you've said Captain Smith was involved in um, uh, skippering the Olympic. So on paper, the British Navy, were, if the word was uh, not liable, they had their money from the insurance, but maybe an underhand agreement that, don't worry, we can work this out and here's the plan. Yes, that's about that about sums it up, yeah. It was also, Simon, a common scam common insurance scam in those days to switch ships identities mm. um so again that's another pointer in in, in favor of this uh th this situation um and i again i i'll, I'll just t tell you another little important fact right i'm, I'm sorry that i seem to be jumping around all over the place here but it, it's just as things occur to me here um there was a uh a seaman by the name of lewis klein who was uh austro-hungarian um and his name has been, he was a, actually meant to be a witness at the American Inquiry. Um, I've, got, I've got the transcripts of the American Inquiry, so I, I know that this is the case. But his name has somehow been expunged from the crew list. Now, I can't imagine why, but you might be able to guess when I tell you what I'm going to tell you. Uh, first of all, he could speak no English, um, but he, he did shout warnings to the lookouts, presumably in English or maybe in broken English. Uh, and uh, because he was on the on the deck at the time of the alleged iceberg, okay. Because even if the, the the Titanic didn't hit an iceberg, which I suspect to be the case, I think it was deliberately steered towards one to create an impression of that. And Lewis Klein shouted warnings to the lookout, and he went to the bridge as well to tell them. And incredibly, and this is his testimony, when he went to the bridge, there was no one there. On the bridge. This is this is the time of the incident. I mean, it's just it's just amazing, really. Apart from an officer who he believed was Murdoch, who was lying motionless, smelling extremely strongly of drink, on a bench at the back of the bridge. So, on arrival at New York on Carpathia, Klein, this this uh, foreign sea guy, foreign seaman, was placed under house arrest and subpoenaed to appear at the American inquiry, but he actually escaped and failed to show. But nevertheless, his written testimony translated was translated from German and submitted to the inquiry. And I think it, you know the listeners will find it interesting to, to hear his testimony. It's quite short, so I'll just read it out. Okay. There was a ball following a banquet of some kind going on down below when I went up on watch at 9.30 o'clock. And the captain and the officers were there with many passengers. After the party, the stewards sent the champagne and wines that were left over to the crew. I know that many of them were drunk. A passenger standing at the rail saw something dead ahead, or maybe a little to the starboard. Look, quick, see the hill over there. I saw it was a big iceberg and ran for the bridge. The third officer was coming towards me and yelled, yelled at me to ask me what the matter was. I couldn't stop to answer. I was too excited. I ran up to the spar with the crow's nest on it and shouted to the lookout I knew was up there to give the alarm. Not a word did I hear, so I started up the spar. It was less than, less than a minute after I left the promenade deck that I got to the top of the spar and found the lookouts fast asleep. I rang the alarm bell myself. Signed, Lewis Klein. Now, make of that what you will. 
uh, that was actually entered into the uh, transcript of the US inquiry. So it's not made up. You know, whether the guy made it up or not is another question, but the actual uh, reporting of it was not made up. So all very strange. I, I think if a film of um, the story that you've just related uh, was made of all the incompetence, the underhandedness, that would gross far more money than, uh, what's that guy, Leonardo DiCaprio? Far more money than that. That yeah. is far more interesting. I mean, and tragic, yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously, and tragic. Uh, that, uh, so yeah. was it, so with yeah. this, this uh, foreign seaman, was um, his testimony, well, obviously it wasn't, testimony uh, taken uh, seriously, I mean, was it put forth in the inquiries to, you know, well, I, I can't no. say I'm surprised, but really... It was read it. out. His testimony was read out to the US inquiry. That's, uh, yeah, that, that is, that's unbelievable, that. Have you anything else um, to add? Yeah, I mean, interesting you mentioned the film. I'll, I'll just tell you a, a little story. Um, I'll try and keep it brief. But in about 2014, I was contacted by uh, an American lady and she left a message on my uh, voicemail. And she said, hi, John, I've just seen your Titanic presentation on YouTube. Uh, it's very interesting. I'm a film director in Hollywood. And um, I'd like you to come over, spend a few weeks with me, and we'll try and tout your story around to a few film producers that I know, which I duly did. Um, uh, and I met one or two Hollywood film producers. I stayed in her fantastic ranch for two weeks over there. and." Uh, we had a, a, an interesting two weeks going around various different film producers in Hollywood. But of course, because of, um, you know, the, the controversial nature of it, obviously none of them wanted to take it, take it up. But I do agree with you that it would make a far better story than the actual real one. Um, so anyway, that was just a little aside. Yeah, that would have been fantastic. I, I know your subject matter covers a wide and interesting spectrum Excellent. And we can't possibly cover it all in one show. So yeah. I hope that you would consider coming back onto this cast. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I hope you've enjoyed yourself as much as I, I have, have, Simon. It's been great. Absolutely. Anytime you want to invite me, I'll be there, Simon. It's been, it's been uh, fascinating and very enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks, John. And that was the John Hamer interview. Wow, basically. That was intense. Can you believe that I forgot to ask my guest where people can find you? <sighs> Classic 101, how not to run a podcast, rookie mistake. But I'm only human and this is definitely a learning curve. So to remind us all, John can be found at falsificationofhistory.co.uk. There is a link to John's site on the show notes, which, by the way, I am definitely not reading from. His books can be purchased from his site and also, of course, on Amazon. To mind you also, John's books are as follows. Behind the Curtains, Volumes 1 and 2, A Chilling Exposé of the Banking Industry, The Falsification of History, Our Distorted Reality, The Olympic, Titanic's Last Secret, and JFK, A Very British Coup. Sorry, John. Okay, I know my sound wasn't great, but I will add there was a two-second delay between every question I asked and the answers from the start of the interview up until the finish but I've spent six hours editing this cast because I really didn't want to lose it so hopefully you can't tell. John was exceptionally interesting and patient and I really enjoyed his company. I sincerely hope he comes back onto the show. As I know, if you forgive the pun, it's only the tip of the iceberg. I've really enjoyed making this cast and I hope you've enjoyed listening. I definitely appreciate you stopping by and taking the time out of your day as it absolutely would not be the same without you. Don't forget to check out our SLK podcast hoodie competition. It's simple, uh, but I suppose asking people where they can find you should have been also. But it is what it is. Anywho, sing the lyrics to our jingle and put the link to your performance on our Facebook page. The jingle was exclusive to the SLK podcast, can only be found on our YouTube channel, uh, the Simon Laurie King podcast. Download, sing along, and the best of luck to you. Give the show a like if you do. Subscribe also so we can alert you to our newest episodes and it will also help spread the show. Feel free to leave a comment, but please keep them kind. You can also find the show on most podcast platforms now. Again, please rate and leave a review if you'd be so kind. And so, my friends, it's time for me to go. And until we meet again, take care, 
be happy. Stay safe. Bye. Slick Podcast. Keeping it real. And always keeping it groovy.